you look go. professional there, man. I love it. Hey, like we gotta, it. we gotta, we gotta, we gotta at least look the part, right? Oh, no, you got the big microphone and the, and, you know, the nice backdrop and yeah, you, man, always, this, this always be branding, part. always yeah. be branding, right? Oh, We're like branding. I like it. I, I I love the microphone. I think that's cool. Hey, appreciate it. Like right. like the feedback. So, ladies and gentlemen, Rob Wygod, Commissioner of the CIF Southern Section, is now joining us on a Unity is Community podcast. Rob, you guys have had uh, a crazy last few months, like the rest of us have. But you're you're trying to put together a plan that has a lot to do with our children, and of course, athletics. And you guys are are so important to the fabric of California high school athletics. Of course, you're the governing body of athletics here in the state. And I mean, when you talk to people around the country, everybody knows who the CIF is. Everybody knows who the CIF is. So, and especially as it pertains to the Southern section, which to my knowledge is the largest section in the country that you oversee. What has that been like throughout the course of this pandemic and trying to get kids back on the field and then having a plan that's going to work. Well, first, Matt, I want to say thanks for inviting me today and always great to see you and talk to you. And, and in response to your question, I mean, certainly these are, these are unprecedented times for us, but we, we've been around for 107 years. And, and what we believe is that we are education-based athletics, that we are educating young people through our high school athletic programs Lessons they're going to learn about life, lessons that are going to make them better adults and make them better people in whatever path they choose to go forward after high school. So we, we really believe that we're rooted in that. And so with the loss of, of high school athletics since the spring, since April, uh, we've been very, very focused on how to get it back. And we know that our student athletes are counting on us. They're depending on us. And uh, we want to be able to deliver for them. And we want to come through and give them those opportunities that they love. And, and get them back to what they are, are used to doing and, and enjoy doing. So you guys, I, I'm sure you've had like 10,000 different plans that you've had to mock up or, or draft up, I should say. What's been the last couple of days been like? You're making the announcement, hey, here's when we're going to move forward. And we'll get into the dates uh, here in a few minutes and, and the championship dates. And I also want to talk about state championships, if that's going to happen at all. Um, but what's it been like the last couple of days, all the media you've been doing? Talk about that. Yeah, it's been a, a pretty busy time and been talking to a lot of people. And, and, uh, and that's been fine because, again, we were excited to be able to get this information out and actually start to, to plan that roadmap. So many people were waiting. It had been so uncertain, not sure if we were going to cancel sports or, or what the format was going to look like and, and how long would the regular season's been. And, would there be section championships and, and, and would those be limited or, or maybe not even ha, ha, you know, canceled those? So there was so much uncertainty uh, leading up to it. It, it kind of crystallized at the, at the beginning of last week. And then we spent quite a bit of time the rest of the week uh, kind of doing those final details for our section calendars. But I'll be honest with you, probably around Thursday or Friday last week, I actually was about as those are about as calm a days as I've had in a while because we had finished the actual work and we're just waiting to, to announce it. And then of course, Monday uh, kind of ramped up a whole nother set of, uh, of things that were going on. So I, I have to share with you and be honest, the last couple of weeks, uh, last Thursday, Friday of last week, were kind of, you know, that, that feeling I had maybe when I was coaching and we finished all our preparation, it was just time to go out and play the game. And, and uh, there wasn't a whole lot of tweaking or, or things we were going to do differently. And that's how I felt at the end of last week. And, 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 and Rob, if, if I can interject here just sure. for a minute, I, I just want to say this. So, you know, obviously we're partners with, with the CIF. And uh, the time that we've worked with you guys, we couldn't ask for better partners. And we have really, really good partners from CADA to the Southern California PGA. Uh, the, list, the list goes on and on. Uh, I, I think I first met you uh, at Casada up in Reno. And I, I think I went up, but I don't know if you remember, I went up, said hi, and you're probably like, who's this guy? But here's what I recall. You were super nice. And you're like, hey, glad, glad you're here. Nice to meet you. And ever since then, you've, you've been super cool. But what I realized is that you're just a good person and you want to try and help as many people as you can. That's, that's my perspective, perspective. And I'm sure everybody in the office is, is going to say the same thing. It's not just to kind of kiss your butt or whatever. I'm just saying from my perspective, really good people to work with. So if you're thinking about sponsoring uh, the Southern section or the state or any other section, 
highly recommended, great people, gonna be able to accomplish a lot, scratch their, their back, they're gonna scratch your back. Uh, it's just a really, really good organization. So Rob, with that, with that said, lots going on. This is unprecedented and I have an awful lot of questions. One of which, one of which people have been talking about, and I've talked to other ADs throughout different states and parents and what have you. Hey, I may want to send my kid elsewhere to play football in the fall and then come back and play in the winter starting in December here in California. So what, what are the rules, bylaws on that? Well, first, uh, I do thank you for your kind words. And, and you know, we, we have a great relationship with you. And, and I think it, it's beyond that kind of a, a relationship in terms of a business thing. We, we consider you family and you treat us like that. And I know you treat our schools like that. I mean, I know our schools love your products. They love the, the great stuff you put together because it always makes them look good. So, uh, and the stuff you've done for us <laughs> makes us look good. So, you know, you're in one of those great, great uh, professions where everything you do just makes, makes it look better than it did before you got your work done. But uh, to your question about the out of state or, or looking for other opportunities, maybe in the fall prior to our seasons, uh, the, the, the rule is clear that throughout the school year, the 2020-2021 school year, a student can play one season of sport. So if a student plays fall football in Montana, then wants to come here in December and then begin our football season, they won't be allowed to do that under CIF bylaws because they would have already had their season of sport. So there'll be some choices that have to be made in that respect if, if parents or students are, are looking to to get something done in the fall, if you will, somewhere where they believe it might be healthier and safer. Uh, if they do want to come back and try to play the same sport here in the same school year, they're, they're not going to be allowed so to So it is, you know, especially for football, because it is a legitimate question. You have some of the kids that are transferring after, you know, the first semester in high school because they want to get a head start or, or what have you to get there for spring ball. So those types of kids – that's it. That's kind of a tough one because maybe that was their plan from the get go. They already signed, sealed and delivered. Maybe that's been the case for the last two or three years where they're going to X school. Uh, they're, they're going in to play spring ball before the freshman year starts. You know, what have you heard about some of those kids? Uh, are, are they staying? Some of them going? What are, what are your thoughts there? Because that does create somewhat of a conflict, right? Yes, it does. And, and there's no question about what you're bringing up as a, as a real scenario happening to, uh, to student athletes. Uh, I, I hope people realize that this isn't necessarily the run of the mill student athlete. I mean, this is a very, very small percentage of student athletes in this position who, who will forego their spring semester of high school to, to already enroll in, in college and be part of that. Uh, that's not a huge number of, of students that do that. But for those that are, are thinking about that or had that as their plan, certainly our movement of the season into December through early April is going to impact that decision tremendously. But what still remains to be seen is what the NCAA is going to be doing. Because if the NCAA is not playing in the fall and pushes their season back to a spring season, and I don't know what these students would do because they wouldn't, the, the regular college season would be, would be taking place. There would be seniors and scholarship players that are still there, which is where these scholarships for the younger student athletes would be opening up. So there could be a real uh, convergence of different issues. Logjam. Yeah, it could be. So, some of the students, real quick, I'll finish that up, but a couple of the students have already announced that they weren't going to play their senior season of football for their high schools uh, already because of fear of injury and, and some things like that, or just the fact that they are already signed or their college experience and so we've seen a couple of those announcements but uh so yeah, and I, I know I, it, in, I, does. I, I don't I don't mean to cut you off no, Rob no. but you know as as a former coach and and now you're the commissioner the largest governing body high school athletics in in the country what are your thoughts on on some of the kids foregoing their senior season just as a as a coach well, what are your thoughts there yeah, well, I'm sure, you know, we would love for the student athletes and as a coach, put my coach back hat on, you know, you want to have them finish up. We've been together three years, four years. We've, we've done a lot, seen the growth of the student athlete to the point where they were that highly desired that they were getting college scholarship offers. So, I mean, we would certainly want to finish it up that way, but then you have to respect a student's decision or a family's decision that they think this is the best uh, decision for them to make and the best path for them to make. They're, they're responsible for those decisions more than I would be as a coach, but uh, I would certainly miss them and only because it would have been nice to to have sort of finished that job that we started with when they came in as freshmen. And just to, 
you know, just, just to wrap this up, you want to go play out of state, uh, quote unquote, starting in the fall, you can't come back and, and play here. So um, lots of good information there. And I'm, I'm, I'm really glad you're able to clarify that uh, not only for this audience, but for everyone else out there too. So now we're getting into, into two seasons. They're starting in December. We can start practicing. I think I saw on the 14th and then games can start on the 8th of January. Let's talk a little bit about how that decision was made to start at the time. And obviously the governor kind of dictates uh, what, what we're supposed to do. Um, one of my questions is, was there science presented to you guys or do you just have to follow the executive orders that are laid out? Like how does that work is, is, as an athletics governing, governing body? We're not health professionals and we don't profess to be. So we certainly respect the California Department of Public Health, the different county health authorities and, and the local health authorities who really, this is what they do and this is what they know best. So we respect what they say. Uh, it, it is not our role to be developing the different procedures for returning to play that the, that the county offices will do or that the California Department of Health will do. So we weren't really working on that. But back to the two to three seasons discussion. And when we started this discussion back in April and May into June, I mean, we were talking about three seasons of sport and somehow being able to spread the, the sports through those three seasons, but we were including the fall, the traditional fall window. And what we saw really with the start of the month of July is that slipping away more and more. They're just, the, the, the evidence, the, the circumstances that were taking place in California, it just became a point where we didn't realistically see that we could use anything uh, in those fall months and, and be able, uh, putting any sports out there during that time frame. So we had actually come to that conclusion, you know, as, as we finalized our, our schedule. As I mentioned to you last week, we kind of finalized with the state on Monday and we got to work in the section offices to do our specific section calendars. So the governor came out on Friday and in many ways he validated what we'd already decided. I mean, I, I wouldn't want people to, to it, it doesn't really matter in terms of that we would have credit for it before them or not. It's just the point I'm making is we had come to the realization we couldn't couldn't use the fall anymore, and that's why it then had to do. Uh, so, in the spring. And, 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 and governor's announcement just said, you know what, we don't see anything happening in the fall either. So the school's not open. And and when you when you think about it, just football for for instance, there's in there's preparation for every single athletic event that you can think of right but football you, you you know you go back to the spring there was no spring ball right you need that time to prepare you got to get your, your program going what if you're a new coach coming in you're you're trying to implement some things and then what if you're just hired in the summer uh there's no passing league right so how do you really have any installs the only time you'd really have any installs is once you get going to two a days and i don't even know if they have those anymore right um so I, I'm looking at just from a coach, and, and you can probably talk better to this than, than I can, but if you're a coach and you're not able to have spring ball, you're not able to have passing league and all the summer workouts that you're doing, how could you really get your team ready and prepared to play at a high level, but more importantly, be in shape, be conditioned to play to where everyone is safe. And, and I'm not even talking about the, the virus, right? I'm just talking about being prepared to play uh, a, not an easy sport, a rough sport, however, a very fun sport. Right. Well, and, and that was a, a huge issue. And, and I think some of our programs were trying to get back out there in June and July, and they were 10 students and one coach, you know, in one area of the field. And there was another group in another area of the field. And they couldn't pass the ball back and forth and they couldn't do, I mean, those were, those, those were such a far stretch from a full practice or even the thought of playing in a game. So we realized that it wasn't going to happen in the fall. It was a race against time and we were going to lose that race. And so uh, football needs the biggest window for their season. If you're going to have a, a regular season, like we're going to have and, and with the, the time to prepare for that, and so we knew once we went into the two season format that there was a way to keep football as a, as a regular season, a full regular season, all of our sports in full regular seasons, which in the three season conversations, many of our seasons probably would have been cut 30%, maybe more. Uh, the regular seasons would have been cut. So that's why we, in the last few weeks, obviously in July, especially that's that conversation moved into two seasons instead of three. So I, I've had I've had these questions come up from from friends and some other folks. You know, what what about the kids 
at like the, the small private schools, say they play basketball and they, and they play baseball and they need these kids to, to play both sports, to field a team. Uh, how much, how much thought was, was given to that? Or is it just, it, we have to make the best decision for everybody as a group and, and it's not going to be perfect. Well, you're right. The overlaps, when we had three seasons on the table, the overlaps were worse. So one of the things about the overlaps in two seasons were there's some natural overlaps. I mean, there's cross country and track. There's swimming and water polo. There's football and wrestling. There's volleyball and basketball. There, there are these natural dual sport kind of situations where a lot of students can, can play those and, and do play those. Some of the three sports, or now like you just gave the example, a basketball, uh, baseball, or basketball, softball student now is in the same season. What people may not realize, we have a rule that says you can play two sports in the same season. So it, our smaller schools, we understand, and they've been clear to us that this is going to be really tough for them. But they actually have the ability, if they can work it out, and their coaches are amenable to it, and the student athletes first you know, have their academics going right. But they could set it up to where a student could do both. And uh, it, would be, it would be not what anyone would, would choose as an ideal situation, but. Well, uh, if you you're, know, I don't mean to cut you off, but I'm, think, I'm thinking about this and this would be, it's, you know, it's like the Deion Sanders, Bo Jackson thing, right? Well, you're going to go, maybe you're practicing full time in one sport and you're just going to play the games in the other sport. And if you're the athlete, you're like, God, that's kind of awesome. Well, again, you know, I, had, I had students when I was an athletic director uh, at the schools I worked at. We had schools that played basketball, students played basketball and soccer in the same season. Three o'clock soccer game in the afternoon, oh, wow. three o'clock basketball game at night. So, yeah, I mean, could the, could the, the girls basketball team have a, a three, you know, many of those student athletes are the softball players. So they have a game at three and then they come and play their basketball game that evening or the way that they can stagger their practices. They can have the, the gym is available at times that the, foot, the softball field's not available. I mean, again, Matt, it's not ideal, but you got to throw Mondays in there. You got to throw Saturdays in there. You got to use all six days of the week for practices and games. You can do some staggering. You know, sometimes the coaches are the same coaches in the smaller schools for both of well, those. Well, in, well, look, I, I like, look, yeah. in this, and I'm a, I'm a proponent of opening up, doing it safely. That's just, that's just my thoughts. Um, but I try and find the positive in, in everything. And so you're talking about being able to play every day. And for instance, like with a sport like baseball, I remember, I remember in high school, you know, you're playing uh, like a Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, maybe, or it's a Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Sometimes you're playing a weekend if, if it's a tournament, but then once you get to college, you start playing. You get to play, you know, your Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or if it's D2, D3, you're playing your Friday, uh, Saturday. And then you're able to get into a groove, right? So in high school, sometimes you don't have that ability to play back-to-back -back games unless you're playing in a tournament. Now it sounds like, and this goes for all the sports too, I guess, you might be able to get into a better groove because you're able to play more games back-to-back. -back. Is that kind of what you're talking about? Yeah. You know, it could be. I mean, like I said, if you look at Monday through Saturday, a typical week, and let's take a girls basketball, girls softball player. I mean, you know, practice for softball could be from two to four and basketball practice can be later than that. Uh, the softball game is on Tuesday in the, in the afternoon and the game for basketball is Tuesday night. There, there are ways that, that the schools can actually manage this and navigate through it, even with the same student athletes. I mean, this is a one time, hopefully, the only time that this kind of thing would have to happen, but uh, I know our small schools are concerned, and I've talked to a lot of them about it, but, but there's, you know, the leagues can do that, the small school leagues, they can certainly work together as a league to, to schedule appropriately and, and give the kids different breaks or different ways where it wouldn't be such a conflict for them. And like I keep saying, you got to throw Monday in there and you got to throw Saturday in there. People don't necessarily like those as, as great days for games and contests, but we're going to have to do that. Our officials, we're going to need uh, a lot of officials coverage and, and things like that. So we, we can't just live in the same kind of model we had where, okay, this is going to be Tuesday and Thursday every week. And that's the way it's going to be. No, it might have to be Monday. It might have to be a Saturday. It might have to be a different configuration. We might have to stagger our practices with two sports going on at the same time, but, but it can be done. I mean, it, it, it can be. And I hope our student athletes are getting that message because the last thing I want to see is the adults take away the optimism that the student athletes have, I hope right now. And I expect that they do. They're going to have seasons. They're going to have championships. They're going to have what they are looking forward to doing. And I just hope our, our adults, all of us, and I count myself, that, well, we, that we give them the right message, that we're going to come through for them. We're going to deliver for them.
And the kids nowadays, more and more, they're specializing in, in one sport, right? And I, I'm, I'm just thinking this is an opportunity. Your main sport, yeah, go play. Go practice all the time, and, but go play another sport. And then I, you just have an opportunity to go build your athleticism at the same time playing your main sport. And yeah, we're worried about getting us injured. Forget that. Go be an athlete. Go play. And when you go play that other sport, you're not going to be thinking – about maybe your main sport. So when you go back to it, maybe the day later, you've already refreshed and you've already forgotten about, maybe you had a failure failure the day before, and now you can just go back and play and have fun. And that's kind of the whole point, go compete, go win, but have fun, build your athleticism. Hopefully someone sees you, hopefully someone wants to give you money to go play at the next level, but at least this, this is almost like a once in a, a, once in a lifetime opportunity maybe to be a Bo Jackson or a Deion Sanders. I don't know what, Rob. I'm getting fired up. I'm going back good, to high school. I just good, paid my house. I want you to get fired up. <laughs> but you're right. I mean, no, you're absolutely right. And, and I think, again, this is a, a unique experience. And I just, my thought is this. I mean, imagine what you just laid out. And if it actually can happen and it gets done. And then we get to look back in that and say, look what we did. You know, look what was able to happen in this experience. And look at how it really was unique and, and special and challenging, no question. But I just have that hope that we're going to be looking back at 2020, 2021, if we can get this done. And we're going to say, wow, we really achieved something special and something that will never be forgotten. Maybe. And like you said, opportunities that maybe, maybe students didn't have in the past. That this particular year, you know, they need to get some extra players from the basketball team to play softball who never played before. Uh, they'll go play softball for the school as well and, and hopefully have a great experience. So maybe we're it, optimistic about it. There's time. You know, we've got time to get this done, and hopefully our schools are, are already – they've rolled up their sleeves, past their elbows, and all the way to their shoulders to get this thing going. And I know they are. They're working hard. Maybe it partially changes today's paradigm of, you know, we, we just talked about a couple of minutes ago of, of specializing in, in one sport. Maybe more and more kids do it during this, this school year. And then, you know, maybe parents, the athletes, they're kind of rethinking – what they're doing and Tommy John Jr. always talked about this and you guys don't know Tommy John Jr. He's a doctor of osteopath chiropractor Tommy John's uh, son okay Tommy John elbow surgery okay his son very intelligent man he wound up playing minor league baseball very smart individual and he said he said this multiple times when you play when you play various sports and you go back and forth you're building athleticism if you just play one sport and he was talking about baseball softball you're just building skill on top of skill, you're not building athleticism. So when you play that, that one sport, you go to another one, you're building your athleticism to where when you go back to that other sport, you're gonna be a better athlete and better playing that sport because of it. So maybe this is one of those things that'll, that'll catapult uh, some of these kids in, into rethinking or reevaluating their plans going forward. I don't know, just a thought. No, you make some great points. And uh, like I said, through, through challenges and through, through difficulties also comes opportunities. And uh, there will be opportunities that we're not necessarily used to. And so it's how we can try to take advantage of those opportunities and actually get them to work for us and, and, and with us. So that's what lies ahead. And, and again, just want to be hopeful that, that we'll be able to navigate through these, these challenges. And again, keeping in mind who it's for. It's for the student athletes and, and us adults have a responsibility to come through for them. So, Rob, a few more things I want to get to that are, that are pretty darn important. So, being able to do this, this safely, what, so what are the guidelines as far as fans or parents, faculty, staff, whomever, being able to watch the athletic events? Or does that depend on each district? What, uh, or did the CIF, is that per section, the state, setting guidelines for how that's going to be rolled out? The one thing that's been consistent throughout is that the decisions on when to even open for academics and how schools are going to start and then bring athletic programs back, those rest with the individual schools, school districts, and private schools. That decision, those decisions are theirs, and that will continue. It's been that way from the beginning. So if the point goes forward and we're back on campuses and then we're ready to bring athletics back, it will still be up to those schools, school districts, private schools to allow fans in or not, to decide that there's social distancing that has to be present, what protocols they're gonna to need to do for testing or temperature checks or whatever those things would be. And those will be coming from their local health, uh, state and local health authorities. So 
as I mentioned, it, it becomes an individual decision on those kinds of factors about who's going to be allowed on campus, who's going to be able to, to participate, who's going to be able to watch, who's going to be able to be part of it. Uh, that's, that's all going to be, be uh, run through that process. So Rob, what have you heard about the importance of, of having uh, masks available for people, whether it's custom or it's, it's kind of the, the, the throwaway ones, having those available on campus and then maybe even testing centers? What, what have you heard about that? What's the potential importance impact there that you've heard? Well, again, I think we have to restore confidence. And that's where when people believe that it's going to be healthy and safe, first for our student athletes to be out there competing, but then for for people to come and watch and for people to to feel that they can come into a gym or go into a football stadium or come out to the pool deck and watch watch the students perform and not feel that they are in any way in harm's way or, or it's going to be risky for them. So that all has to come as we develop the protocols going forward to try to take control of this uh, pandemic. And uh, again, we're going to be working with the local health authorities and and the people responsible for the testing, responsible for the tracing, responsible for providing the guidelines for our schools to follow and uh, allow those folks who are the health professionals to do their jobs and we'll support them and support uh, the work that, that needs to be done so that we can restore that confidence. So we've seen, we've seen a lot of people uh, have, have interest in a lot of canopies for the outdoors and it's safer yeah. to be outdoors because of UV and, and, and all that good stuff, right? Um, and, and being able to have a central location, location for the student athletes to be in. And, and even if it's a sport where, you know, you're going to be inside, maybe it's basketball, you're going to be practicing outside instead of inside. Who knows? I don't know. But being able to have that type of shade, it looks awesome. You got the custom aspects to it. And then also with the mask, like, Rob, I also envision after COVID is over, people are going to be having like red outs or blackouts or or whiteouts in the stands wearing masks, custom masks for the high school, right? Yeah. You just oh, let sure. everyone know, hey, in the stands, and I, I just envision, like that to me would just be super cool um, yeah. to have something like that. So above and beyond this and the safety aspects, I think it's something that's, that's still gonna be around even for like a, a fashion statement or, or branding or school pride type of thing. Well, yeah, I think people are trying to embrace what this is about and, and obviously, uh, doing something like that. I mean, we've seen for years uh, other nations of the world, maybe mostly in, in Asia, that you would see normally that the people wore masks all the time, regardless of this. Well, in the United States of America now, we're becoming much more familiar with, with wearing masks. And people do it, and they need to do it. And uh, so I think you're right. I think we're onto something that we maybe didn't think was uh, uh, an accessory in the United States that we were embracing. But uh, we see it. We should see it. And, uh, and it'll be exciting maybe if, if that's what people want to do. I mean, we're, we need to get our CIF Southern Section branded masks. We haven't done that. Um, we need to probably do that. So if you got any ideas of what they would look like, send me a mock-up. <laughs> I will do that. I'm sure I you will, will do that. I'm sure you will. Um, you know what's interesting, Rob, about this whole thing is that, you know, as, as, as Americans, we're always like, work, 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 go, 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 go. Um, you know, not really allowing ourselves to have time off even even when we are sick and i mean how many times have you have you gone to work when you haven't you haven't felt well or maybe you've even had the flu we've all done it how many times she's like i can't miss work i get a bunch of stuff i gotta get done but now with it's uh, it being totally normal to be at home and working and getting things done we don't necessarily have to go into work if we're feeling sick As a matter of fact stay the heck home right so that's if if we learned anything about this stay the stay the heck home if you're if you're not feeling well either way because i mean the flu is still killing thousands upon thousands of people every single year which you know is not really talked about very much so and to your point if we learn anything maybe from some of the other countries where if they are feeling ill they do they do throw on a mask you know um we have learned a lot and and we uh have realized we can get a lot done and in a section as large as ours you know it's it's probably going to be beneficial to to having more done this way because a lot of times folks have to travel around a lot, drive two, three hours to, to do something or attend a meeting here or do some things like that. I think we're going to be a lot more uh, selective about when we really do need people to have to move around and, and when we might be able to just accomplish the same thing by doing it this way uh, virtually. So we have sure. we've, we've found out we have a lot more capabilities than maybe we thought before this took over. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I was. Yes, we do. And, and uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was fun. It was interesting. I watched the uh, Angels Padre game the other night, and it was at Petco Park in San Diego. And there was, you know, there was no fans, and even the, the pitchers were like down the lines. It provided another opportunity for, uh, the ball club to, to advertise with some various things, but um, it would, it would be nice to see some fans yeah. in there and like spacing, spacing them out a little I bit, you know, wear a mask, you can drink through a straw. Yeah. I'm a proponent of seeing stuff like that. And, you know, I understand the safety. It's just, it's different. We're going to have to navigate through it, I guess. I love sports more than anybody, but I tell you, I'm, I'm struggling with it because so much of, of, of watching those athletes at the highest levels and, and pro sports and even college and all is the experience, you know, being there. And then the other part is if you're not there, you know, maybe you're at home and you have friends over to watch or you go to a restaurant bar, sports bar and watch it with a group. I mean, it's just, that's part of it for me. I, I, the skill level's great and it's fun to watch them play, but I just think it's, it's so much more than just the, uh, the ability of the players. It's, it's that it's atmosphere. It's the people. Yeah, it's the atmosphere. It's the, it's the experience. And the set, being there live or, or even having a party at your house where everybody comes over to watch the game, or again, going to the restaurant and the, and the sports bar or whatever to watch it with a bunch of people that are you know, fans and passionate fans. That, to me, I hope that I don't know that the pro sports and the, some of these folks have thought about that as much. I think they think, well, if we just put the product out there, everybody's going to miss it. Everybody's going to love it. Everybody thinks it's great that they can watch LeBron James again. And that can be true. Uh, but I think there's more to it than just watching. I haven't cared, Rob. I have I, not. I'm having trouble with it. I'm having real trouble. I used, to, I, used to consume, I used to consume this stuff every day, uh, especially uh, the NFL. And then my team moved to L.A. and I stopped caring. Um, mm -hmm. But even even with with baseball, you're following you're following all the stuff that's that's uh, at least for me. And then yeah. keeping up with keeping up with basketball and of course uh, college basketball and all that stuff. Um, but it's just it's been a challenge. I'm like I I had to, I had to ask my buddy the other day, and I'm like, when's the opening day? I didn't even know. I had, and I have the app on my phone. I didn't yeah. even look on my phone. I'm like, oh, I forgot I have the app on my phone. Yeah. Um, so to your point, yeah. And then I watched the game the other night. I'm like. Ah. This is hard. This is this is hard to watch. Yeah. We so, got a couple of real diehard Dodger fans here. They were watching that first game with the Angels, and they were like, oh, you know, it was good to watch them play again and all that. But I'm struggling with it a little bit. I haven't really had the time to, to watch it that much. And then I see the schedules posted, and I think, you know, Dodgers here. And the, and, and I'm like, but they're going to go to San Diego and play, but there's nobody going to watch. It's yeah, like, it's weird. You know, I get it. 60 games is kind of – you know, they're, they look they've not even half a season. And, and it's just, it's, you know, you're, you're trying to look about why are we pushing so hard for it? And we know why they're pushing so hard for it. And it, and it has more to do with their TV contracts and the money and all the other things going on. And I just, to the life of me, don't know how the NFL thinks they're going to play. I, I, I just don't know. Well, how they I play. bet, I bet anyone, anything that by week four, the NFL is going to be at a hundred percent capacity. Really? I bet, I bet you week one, maybe week two, Wow. No fans. Week three, there. Look, it's the NFL. It's all about money, right? Yeah, in my just, in my opinion. But they just took all the tickets away. They took all the season tickets away. They took all the single game tickets away. They're refunding everybody who bought single game tickets. So, I don't know that they're. You know, they may have to re up the whole thing and start over. But that just got announced a couple of days ago, and and they they don't anticipate having fans this season. Or if they do, it's at such a limited number that they just had to throw everybody back out to square one and say, if we're only allowed 15,000 fans, then we got to start over. We can't say we already got 60,000 who bought tickets, so we can't do that. Yeah. And so we'll have to wait and see. I, I don't know how it can happen. I just don't. I, 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 not at this time frame, but, you know, they're talking about opening training camp and they're going to test everybody and they're going to make sure – the protocols are followed and they keep everybody under control. They believe that, that they think they can do it. So we'll see. I mean, I don't wish any ill will. I certainly don't wish no. anybody to get this virus. I don't want anybody to get sick and, and I don't want their families to get sick or anything like that. But, you know, sometimes I just wonder about some of the, the professional leagues and some of these folks, if they don't really try to understand a, a bigger picture sometimes. Sure. Sure. Hey, let's get, let's get back to high school real quick. Last couple of things here. Uh, yeah. Officiating. What's that going to look like? Are there going to be enough uh, officials, referees, umpires for, for each game? Uh, how, what's that looking like with kind of the condensed uh, two, uh, two quote-unquote season um, activities, if we will, or, you know, the winter and then, and then the spring? We already had a shortage of officials. I mean, it was, it was happening before this. It was th throughout our section. 
and uh, a lot of different sports, we had a shortage already. So this isn't going to help. But uh, what also happens sometimes, and, and I hope, again, scheduling is going to be key. We're going to have to make sure we do the best we can, maybe double headers at times where the same officials can work more than one contest. We've got to throw Mondays and Saturdays in there as contest days so that we can maximize the use of our facilities and use of the, of the days of the week to have games. But other thing that happens sometimes in difficult economies is that we get more people that want to officiate. Uh, when the economy takes a hit, past experience has shown that we have more people to get involved. So, you know, that may happen. I certainly, again, I'm not pleased that our economy is uh, having difficult times, but, but that is one thing that we've seen happen. And so uh, there are some, there, there, you know, some months ahead of us. There's, there's four months or so ahead of us before our season started. I know our officials groups are going to work hard on, on recruiting new ones. And I tell our schools this too, it's not just the officials jobs. If every school in our section brought one young man or one young woman who's just graduated from their high school, that's 500 new officials more than 500 new officials. If we got one from every school, you know, they're a junior college student or a four-year college student and they're working, you know, uh, in the afternoons after school's done for college, they can come and do a, a freshman basketball game or a soccer game or, or whatever. I mean, they can make extra money. It's a, it's a sport they've hopefully played in high school and they enjoy. They didn't go on to play in college. It's just, I mean, you, you could make $70 working a, a lower level softball game in a two hour period, who, what job is a college student going to find at $35 an hour? They're not going to find it, but they can no. find an official. So we can find one student in every school. We get 500 new officials into the mix. They're and new. it's, and it's fun. If well, you're someone, and if you're someone who knows, and I, I did this, I was, uh, I was an umpire in high school. I loved it. Yeah. It was fun. Yeah. I, if you're someone who knows the rules and feels pretty comfortable, confident about it, go be an official, go be a ref, go be an umpire. It's fun. Yeah. It's fun. You know, you're talking, you know, you get to talk to, if you like talking to people too, even if you don't, it's just, it's funny You talk to the coaches, uh, maybe some of the parents, if, if they're out there type of thing, and you get to go officiate, you get to go officiate and yeah. you're contributing, you're helping. And our young people who might get involved in it, I think, understandably, they look at it and think to themselves, you know, I'm going to be out there on Friday night at 730 in the biggest game of the year refing a basketball game. No, you're not. You're going to start out with freshman boys, freshman girls. You're going to, you're going to work lower level games. You're going to work with 10 or 15 people in the stands. You know, you're not going to be in this, in this pit with thousands <laughs> of people screaming at you. Uh, so as I said, it's just part of this thing. It's everybody's issue. Like the schools need to get involved and identify some of these prospective officials. Our officials groups have to do their part, train them, you know, give them a good experience so that they want to stay with officiating. Our schools got to treat them right. Our parents, are, are, we got to treat these officials right or we're not going to have them. You know, everyone really needs to, to get involved in that one. And, and as I said, I'm hoping that in these next few months, as we have the calendar out there, we have the situation now in front of everyone, there's some time to start getting some new officials involved. And again, we're going to need to do a great job scheduling to maximize the officials that are out there. And, and I'm hoping that we can do it. And Rob, almost done here. So championships. So sex playoffs and in section championships, What's that going to look like for any, are you calling it the fall or the winter or the winter? Uh, we're doing fall and spring. Fall and spring. Okay. So what, what does it look like for, for each? Well, we thought it was very important about regular seasons first. And, and the fact that we could keep our regular seasons basically 90% to 100% of what they normally are. We knew that was important because everybody plays in the regular season. Now you get to the playoffs. We believe that our student athletes want that, that experience. So we didn't limit that. In other words, league champions, second place teams, third place teams that normally advance the playoffs are going to get that opportunity. We didn't, we didn't condense it to the point where only league champions got to go or, or we had to, to, to limit that. So same number of, of champions, same number of divisions, same number of entries from each league. All of that's done. Uh, the state office has uh, normally conducted two weeks, maybe even three week tournaments in certain sports that have regional or state championships. State office has made the commitment that their competitions will be no more than one week. So in every sport that has a state or regional championship, whatever that combination is going to be, it's going to no, not take any longer than one week. So, you know, that combination, I think, is what we brought out there on Monday. And I think people were excited to see full regular seasons, full section championships with you know, people want section championships. They, they, they care more about section championships. Than they do about state and regional championships. Yeah. The state office knows that, too. So it's not like I'm being... You know, dismissive of them, but section championships are more meaningful to, to schools in, in our sections, and they're going to get that. And so we, so, felt, I, we and, felt that was about as good as we could do. And you're, you're the perfect person to ask about this because being a commissioner of the largest 
section in the country. And how many leagues does the Southern section consist? Is it 70, 75? Now, what is it? 88. It's 88 now? 88 leagues, yeah. <laughs> okay. So how do, you, how do you schedule all that? And I've always wondered, yeah. uh, even, even after, as it pertains to football, because, you know, you used to play at Angel Stadium for the section champions. Sometimes it would be at, at different high schools. You know, so how do you guys go about scheduling all that stuff? Well, we, we have uh, big tournaments and we have large brackets and a lot of schools involved. And we just, we have those designated dates and times that we schedule for the games. And then we, we provide the matchups and, and then we all track it as it goes forward and begin to work each round as it, as it happens. And we assign all the officials for every one of those games. So we have to make sure that we have officials there for, for all of them. And it's a big job. It's a big task. And we have five very dedicated assistant commissioners here that, that are involved in, in managing the different sports that they're in charge of. And I, I was an assistant commissioner for 11 years before I became commissioner. So I'm pretty familiar with how that all works. And uh, yeah, it's a monumental task, but you know, Matt, it's the, it's the thing we love to do. It's what we do. It's, it's what we uh, try to provide those experiences and make those memories for everybody involved. And that, that's what we do. We believe we're in the, in the business to make memories when it comes to playoff time. So uh, it's, it's a big challenge. We're working seven days a week. It's a, uh, it's very, very busy time for us, but, uh, we kind of gear up for it and we, uh, we get ready for it. And then we hopefully look at it play out as it should and, and give these uh, student athletes that opportunity to, to, again, take away experiences for the, the rest of their lives. They'll never forget. Well, I would like to say this, Rob, uh, thank you, uh, to you and everyone on the staff there at the CIF Southern section and, and state and statewide, every section in the state. You guys have been working, working your butts off uh, to try and make these things happen. Now, is everyone going to be happy about this? No, but not everyone's happy about everything anyways. It's just making the best of it. And like we talked about, it just seems like there's a heck of a lot of opportunity here for everybody from the officials to the coaches to the athletes. Uh, to the staff, like to, to everybody, the parents, everybody involved. It just seems like there's an awful lot of opportunity. You guys are a huge part of that, and we just want to say thank you. Well, that's very nice of you to say, and I, I say you're welcome, and I say thank you uh, for all that you do and your kind words. And as I said, we just, if you keep your focus on the student athletes, even those that may not be happy, those that thought it could have been done differently, wanted it a different format. But I think I'm trying real hard to just remember our student athletes. They've had enough negativity. They've heard enough about what's been taken away from them. And now that we've been able to provide them with that plan and that path going forward, you know, we adults need to be on a positive message and we need to be able to let them know that we can do this and we can make it happen for them. And we don't need to be negative about it. We don't need to say what could have been or might have been or could have been more perfect, if you will. Let's just kind of keep that in mind, keep the focus on mind. These young people need us and they need us to, to come through. And that's what we got to do. And, and I truly believe we can with the factors we control. This virus goes to a point we can't control it like it happened in the spring and schools shut down. Well, unfortunately, that's going to be out of our hands. And I hope that doesn't happen. But if we're able to go forward and able to get this done, then as I said to you earlier, we'll, we'll look back and say, this is incredible what was achieved. But we kept the student athletes in mind first first and always. That's who it's for, not us adults. It's our job to make it happen for them. You know what, Rob? Thank you, as always. Really do appreciate it. I think there's a lot of good information here that, uh, that we can share, and you've already been talking about this the last, the last few days, but I think we, we may have covered some things that maybe you guys didn't talk about. Um, yep. So with that said, thank you. We'll put together the uh, uh, the information there with the mask that you had a mock up there, but um, <laughs> you, you already said it. You know I would. Um, of course, it'll, it'll be nice. It'll be nice looking. It'll go with our our uh, cornhole set, and it'll go with our other little things that we have, and our canopies that you've done so nicely for us. Our cheer canopy that's the envy of the civilized world. That the, the backdrop <laughs> we've done with that, <laughs> that they're like, oh my goodness gracious. So it's all good. They look good. They look all good. Right. Well, Rob, thanks again. I appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of the day. Keep up the good work, and, and we'll touch base here soon. Sounds great. Thanks again, Matt. Great to be with you. Appreciate it. And all the best to you and your family. Stay well. Stay safe. Will do. Thanks again. Right. You as well. Thanks, Rob. Okay.